Well, materials acceleration platforms build a little bit on the shoulders of giants. Yeah? So in the 90s, people started to automate materials uh, research by essentially having small robots that do certain tasks a little faster. Then um, this continued for like 10, 20 years, uh, such that in like 2010 around that, the Americans started something called the Materials Genome Initiative. Um, so this was shortly after the human genome uh, got decoded. Um, and they thought, well, let's try to do the same for materials because we have in material science this interesting thing that it typically takes 40 years from the discovery of a new effect or a new material to actually proliferate to the market. And 40 years is a time that we don't have. Um, and by the way, this absolutely holds true for batteries. So um, the, most of the battery materials and most of the well, very fundamental um, things for which the Nobel Prize two years ago now was awarded, they were all found about 30 to 40 years ago. And now we really have you know, uh, a proliferation to the market um, that is very successful and very great. Um, and in the Materials Genome Initiative, people asked themselves, okay, now we have these automated setups, um, we have this, this cool new thing, I mean, this is, this is now 12 years ago, yeah? Um, we have this new cool thing called like machine learning and digitalization, um, maybe we can do something about that. And what they came up with is this term inverse design. So inverse design mostly um, had this idea of finding descriptors, so uh, the colleagues watching this in catalysis might very well know the volcano plot. And um, that, was, that was, let's say, a, a design tool that people could use. Now, in a materials acceleration platform, we want to take the ideas of automation, uh, this inverse design, and add to that the idea of integration and machine learning, or also integration through machine learning, because uh, oftentimes you have things um, like, let's say, crystal structures or morphologies that are not directly translatable or actually derivable for optimization, um, and we need a way to, to make it understandable for the computer, let's say. We need to teach a computer chemistry. And this is, in the end, what a materials acceleration platform tries to do. It tries to integrate the different methods from experimental material science and computational material science. And so far, these two things have been, um, they, they usually try to describe the same thing, but they are very seldomly in one automated or even autonomous workflow. And this is really what our materials acceleration platform try to do for the first time. So we have um, what I call a localized experimental materials acceleration platform. So this is Places R. That's a platform for accelerated electrochemical energy storage research. And um, we uh, try to integrate this platform, Places R, into a bigger European project called BigMap. So that's the battery interface genome materials acceleration platform. Essentially the same thing that we are trying to do here, but on a European scale. Because, and this is a realization that is absolutely true for anyone, nobody can do research alone. Not a single researcher, not a single research group, not an institute. We need international collaboration. And we try to solve exactly this problem of how can we streamline international collaboration, ideally around the clock, ideally over long periods of time, and also between um, modalities and, and between completely different fields um, that sometimes, let's say, have trouble speaking to each other. Because, uh, uh, you know, some, sometimes uh, we, we have it all the time that sometimes people say, oh yeah, I, I need, uh, I don't know, molarity or molality. Uh, and uh, there are all these disambiguities that, that sometimes make research complicated. And um, yeah, this is what this uh, materials acceleration platform try to solve, and I think it kind of did. <laughs> uh, not, not, not to an end that it's, that it's now in production uh, around the clock or, or, or we are done, but uh, we, um, for me this is a small, I don't know, man on the moon moment really when it was running for the first time. I mean, maybe this is a little bit big, but I was very happy when it finally worked um, because uh, actually having other people trigger an experiment in our lab um, and triggering a calculation on the supercomputer, and this is all completely autonomous without our uh, doing uh, uh, anything active in the process, it was kind of cool. <laughs>
So in our demo run, we had three different tenants in our little map, which uh, um, comprise a simulation tenant, an experimental setup, and an optimizer. And each of these components was located spread all across Europe, and they were all communicating through Finalis. And basically the goal was to have this communication working effectively, so the optimizer is supposed to pull data from the database organized by Finalis and basically do machine learning on the data that is already there and decide on what could be a good follow-up experiment. And then the optimizer can send a request to Finalis which is then picked up by either the simulation tenant or the experimental setup, depending on what was requested. And the respective tenant will give feedback and uh, report its results back to Finalis, which then can trigger a, rip a second loop, basically. And uh, our goal was to have this loop running autonomously for a certain time, and we actually managed to keep it running for four and a half hours without any one of us touching the system. The, the European system. <laughs> <laughs> Big arms. <laughs> <laughs>The role of the software is essentially that of a broker. So one can imagine like a marketplace um, where we have the, the three tenants, we, we have a couple of more tenants um, uh, as well, like uh, one that can even predict like conductivity and, and such uh, developed in, in Switzerland. Um, but essentially what this, this, this brokerage software does is um, that every tenant in this, in this map can uh, scream onto the marketplace or, or deposit somewhere on the marketplace a request for a measurement. Um, that could be, hey, somebody measure me the, I don't know, the, the density. Uh, this is, for instance, what Monica's system uh, was, was doing, density and viscosity measurements, uh, for a EC EMC 50-50 mixture. Yeah? I don't even know if that's a solid or not. But anyway, so... Um, then you, you can post it to the, to the marketplace and others can check whether or not they are able to perform this kind of measurement. Then they can say, okay, I, I did the measurement, here's the result. And then the optimizer can read in the data. So what, what, the, what the Finale software really is, is essentially just a, a server with a very well-defined data structure um, that also gives let's say, feedback on, oh, yeah, you're not, you didn't report that right or you didn't uh, properly formulate your request. And that is the core functionality of Finalis. The idea of that is, however, a little, it goes a little bit beyond battery research and beyond what this actual demo run was. And that is, if you do a measurement, the really, the, the really profound thing is, the measurement device doesn't care why you're doing this. And very often in, in, the, in the traditional workflows that, that we define uh, in, in our everyday research life is, oh yeah, I'm measuring the density because I want to, I don't know, get the density low. Or I'm measuring the viscosity because I want to get the viscosity low or, or whatever. I usually have an intention with this. And Finalis, which stands for the Fast Intention Agnostic Learning Server, doesn't care about um, or the, the instruments do not care about why they are doing this. And I think this is a, this is a very powerful um, way of orchestrating research because that way, if you just offer a measurement as a service or a lab as a service, um, you can essentially do, well, not maybe double blind research, but blinder research because you don't know um, as a researcher, because Finalis could also work without robots, it could just work with, with manual experiments. Um, if you don't know why you're doing this, you have less of a bias of making it specifically good or specifically bad. Um, which you, I mean, this is not to say that researchers do this, but you, you just, um, I don't know, you, you might have that, that bias, oh yeah, this cell I really need to make good. This cell I really need to make bad. Um, 
which is essentially why we have double-blind uh, studies, but we don't have this in material science necessarily. Yeah? People usually do an experiment and then in the end they, they, they report the findings, whereas here uh, I can send a, a experiment to someone somewhere around the globe. They don't even know, and they really don't know why I'm sending them this particular request. I can get the data back and this, in the end, helps much, much more in training, um, you know, some of the optimizers that we do, um, because they uh, they can also very nicely incorporate uncertainty, which means I can, for instance, send the same request out to multiple tenants that all do the same stuff. So this is multi-tenancy, and then get the data back, and not just have a data point, but I also have. Um, let's say a distribution and an uncertainty of, uh, about this, and this usually helps me um, to to well, uh, well, let's say capitalize on the fact that I have more than just one data point and, and knowing how uncertain the, the 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 measurement might be, or maybe if there is some biases between labs, this can also happen. This is exactly why we have round robot tests. Uh, these things exist. Well, the key point we wanted to show was that this communication is actually possible spread all across Europe. So potentially it's even possible on a global scale to do the same thing. Um, also, we wanted to show that it's possible to combine simulation results and actual measurements in one uh, machine learning model to process that and to have um, to generate new requests for new experiments or simulations based on that. Well, let's start with the how many could be involved. Um, so we, we ran around uh, Christmas last year when, when I wrote the majority of the code for, for Finales. Um, the, we did do a, a stress test on my laptop where it was running. So this was around 5,000 per second. Um, so give or take 5,000. Um, the actual server was, was hosted in Karlsruhe. So um, yeah, so we, we have that. Then we have uh, different tenants. Um, we had one tenant here in uh, Ulm, which was uh, Monika Setup, um, which was able to formulate electrolytes um, based on different compounds uh, and then measure viscosity and density. Then we had um, one tenant that was, uh, let's say, also globally distributed <laughs> uh, uh, from uh, uh, Dassault Systems, so 3DS, um, which are uh, officially in France, but they also have dependencies, I think, around the globe. Um, the, the, the majority of their team was actually from uh, France and the UK. Then we had uh, the optimizer running at uh, Denmark Technical University, so uh, they are based in Lingby, which is near Copenhagen. Um, the ontology uh, that, let's say, glued the whole thing together and also made it compatible to, uh, uh, to let's say, other projects um, that was developed uh, at Sintef in Norway. Um, then we had the Swiss colleagues uh, who built a tenant that was able to predict um, the electrolyte conductivity uh, based on a previous studies, uh, a study that we did. Um, so so this, this, is, this is what we, what we have uh, uh, right now, but in principle we could extend it, and in fact, we are going to extend it. Um, we will have, uh, not next week, but in two weeks, uh, a, uh, a small, big meeting in, uh, in, in Copenhagen, uh, where we will sit down uh, together with our colleagues and uh, discuss a little bit the strategy, how we can uh, essentially scale out Finales to uh, all of BigMap which is around 30 uh, uh, yeah, partners from academia and industry. And I think if we have that, then we have a really, well, European, almost global uh, materials acceleration platform um, that, like that, has never existed before. Um, based on our experiences during this demo run, we identified a lot of lessons learned which uh, need to be Im yeah, improved and developed in the future to have a more 
a flexible and more stable system to be able to scale it up actually. So our next step will be to collect all the requirements to spread it actually across big maps. So there are a lot of different parties involved and uh, everyone has slightly different um, expectations and requirements. So we're going to collect all these and uh, develop the system further to cover all these needs um, to involve as many partners as possible.